Under the Maple Leaves by John Burroughs The Pleasures of a Naturalist How closely every crack and corner of nature is packed with life, especially in our northern temperate zone. I was impressed with this fact when during several June days I was occupied with road mending on the farm where I was born. To open up the loosely piled and decaying laminated rocks was to open up a little biological and zoological museum. So many of our smaller forms of life harbored there. From chipmunks to ants and spiders, animal life flourished. We disturbed the chipmunks in their den a foot and a half or more beneath the loosely piled rocks. There were two of them in a soft, warm nest of dry, shredded maple leaves. They did not wait to be turned out of doors, but when they heard the racket overhead bolted precipitately. Two living together surprised me, as heretofore I had never known but one in a den. Near them a milk snake had stowed himself away in a crevice, and in the little earthquake which we set up got badly crushed. Two little red-bellied snakes about one foot long had also found harbor there. The ants rushed about in great consternation when their eggs were suddenly exposed. In fact, there was live natural history under, under every stone about us. Some children brought me pieces of stone, which they picked up close by, which sheltered a variety of cocoon-building spiders. One small, dark-striped spider was carrying about its ball of eggs, the size of a large pea, attached to the hind part of its body. This became detached when she seized it eagerly and bore it about held between her legs. Another fragment of stone the size of one's hand sheltered the chrysalis of some species of butterfly which was attached to it at its tail. It was surprising to see this enshrouded creature, blind and deaf, wriggle and thrash about as if threatening us with its wrath for invading its sanctuary. One would about as soon expect to see an egg protest. Thus the naturalist finds his pleasure everywhere. Every solitude to him is peopled. Every morning or evening walk yields him a harvest to eye or ear. The born naturalist is one of the most lucky men in the world. Winter or summer, rain or shine, at home or abroad, walking or riding, his pleasures are always near at hand. The great book of nature is open before him, and he has only to turn the leaves. A friend sitting on my porch in a hickory rocking chair the other day was annoyed by one of our small solitary wasps that seemed to want to occupy the chair. It held a small worm in its legs. She would shoo it away only to see it back in a few seconds. I assured her that it did not want to sting her, but it but that its nest was somewhere in the chair. And sure enough, as soon as she quieted down, it entered a small opening in the end of one of the chair arms, and deposited its worms and presently was back with another, and then a third and a fourth. And before the day was done, it came with little pellets of mud and sealed up the opening. My morning walk up to the beech wood often brings me new knowledge and new glimpses of nature. This morning I saw a hummingbird take its bath in the, in the big dewdrops of a small ash tree. I have seen other birds bathe in the dew or raindrops on tree foliage, but did not before know that the hummer bathed, its, bathed at all. I also discovered that the webs of the little spiders in the road, when saturated with moisture, as they were from the early morning, early fog this morning, exhibit primastic tints, pris, prismatic tints, as every thread of web was strung with minute spherules of moisture, and they displaced all the tints of the rainbow. In each of them I saw one abutment of a tiny rainbow. When I stepped a pace or two to the other side, I saw the other abutment. Of course, I could not see the completed bow in so small an area. These fragments are as unapproachable as the bow in the clouds. I also saw 
that where a suspended dewdrop becomes a jewel or displays rainbow tints, you can see only one at a time to the right or left of you. <clears throat> it also is a fragment of a rainbow. Those persons who report beholding a great display of prismatic effects in the foliage of trees or in the grass after a shower are not to be credited. You may see the drops glistening in the sun like glass beads, but they will not exhibit prismatic tints. In only one, in only one at a time you will see rainbow tints. Change your position and you may see another, but never a great display of prismatic tints at one time. In my walk the other morning I turned over a stone, looking for spiders and ants. These I found, and in addition there were two cells of one of our solitary leaf cutters, which we as boys called sweet bees, because they came around us and would alight on our sweaty hands and arms as if in quest of salt, as they probably were. It is about the size of a honey bee, of lighter color, and its abdomen is yellow and very flexible. It carries its pollen on its abdomen and not upon its thighs. These cells were of a greenish-brown color. Each of them was like a miniature barrel in which the pollen with the egg of the bee was sealed up. When the egg hatches, the grub finds a loaf of bread at hand for its nourishment. These little barrels were each headed up with a dozen, dozen circular bits of leaves cut as, if, as with a compass exactly fitting the cylinder, one upon the other. The wall of the cylinder was made up of oblong cuttings from leaves about half an inch wide and three quarters of an inch long. A dozen of them lapped over one another and fitted together in the most workmanlike manner. In my boyhood I occasionally saw this bee cutting out her nesting material. Her mandibles worked like perfect shears. When she had cut out her circular or her oblong patches, she rolled them up and holding them between her legs flew away with them. I have seen her carry them into little openings in old rails or old posts about the period of hatching. I do not know. Swallows, in hawking through the air for insects, do not snap their game up as do their true flycatchers as do the true flycatchers. Their mouths are little nets which they drive through the air with the speed of airplanes. A few mornings ago the air was cold but it contained many gauzy, fuzzy insects from the size of mosquitoes down to gnats. They kept near the ground. I happened to be sitting on the sunny side of a rock and saw the swallows sweep past. One came up within ten feet of me and drove straight on to a very conspicuous insect which disappeared in his own mouth in a flash. How many hundreds or thousands of such insects they must devour each day. Then think of how many insects the flycatchers and warblers and other insect-eating birds must consume in the course of a season. We little suspect how the woods and wayside places swarm with life. We see little of it unless we watch and wait. The wild creatures are cautious about revealing themselves. Their enemies are on the lookout for them. Certain woods at night are alive with flying squirrels which, except for some accident, we never see by day. Then there are the night prowlers, skunks, foxes, coons, minks, and owls, yes, and mice. The wild mice we rarely see. The little shrew mole, which I know is active at night, I have never seen but once. I once set a trap called the, the delusion trap in the woods by some rocks where I had no reason to suspect there were m more mice than elsewhere, and two mornings later it was literally packed full of mice, half a dozen or more. <clears throat> Turn over a stone in the fields and behold the consternation among the small folk beneath it. Ants, slugs, bugs, worms, spiders all objecting to the full light of day. Not because their deeds are evil, but because the instinct of self-preservation prompts this course. As I write these sentences, a chipmunk who has his den in the bank by the roadside nearby is very busy storing up some half-ripe currants, currants, which grew on a bush a few yards away. Of course, the currants 
will ferment and rot, but that consideration does not disturb him. The seeds will keep, and they are what he is after. In the early summer, before any of the nuts and grains are ripened, the high cost of living, of living among the lesser rodents is very great, and they resort to all sorts of makeshifts. In regard to this fullness of life in the hidden places of nature, Darwin says, as much of the world as a whole, well may be, if, well may be, well may we affirm that every part of the world is inhabitable, whether lakes of brine or those subterranean ones hidden beneath volcanic mountains, warm mineral springs, the wide expanse and depth of the ocean, the upper regions of the atmosphere, and even the surface of perpetual snow all support organic beings. Never before was there such a lover of natural history as Darwin. In the earth, in the air, in the water, in the rocks, in the sand, in the mud, he scanned the great biological record of the, of the globe as it was never scanned before. During the voyage of the Beagle he shirked no hardships to add to his stores of natural knowledge. He would leave the comfortable ship while it was making its surveys and make journeys of hundreds of miles on horseback through rough and dangerous regions to glean new facts. Grass and water for his mules and geology or botany or zoology or anthropology for himself, and he was happy. At a great altitude in the Andes the people had shortness of breath, which they called puna, and they ate onions to correct it. Darwin says, with a twinkle in his eye, for my part, I found nothing so good as the fossil shells. His Beagle Voyage is a regular magazine of natural history knowledge. Was any country ever before so searched and sifted for its biological facts? In lakes and rivers, in swamps, in woods, everywhere his insatiable eye penetrated. One rereads him always with a different purpose in mind. If you happen to be interested in insects, you read him for that. If in birds, you read him for that. If in mammals, in fossils, in reptiles, in volcanoes, in anthropology, you read him with each of these subjects in mind. I recently had in mind the problem of the soaring condor, and I reread him for that, and sure enough he had studied and mastered that subject too. If you are interested in seeing how the biological characteristics of the two continents, North and South America, agree or contrast with each other, you will find what you wish to know. You will learn that in South America the lightning bugs and glowworms of many kinds are the same as in North America, that the beetle or elater, when placed upon its back, snaps itself up in the air and falls upon its feet, as our species does, that the obscene fungus or phallus taints the tropical forests as a similar species at times taints our dooryards and pasture borders, and that the mud dauber wasps stuff their clay cells with half-dead spiders for their young, just as in North America. Of course, there are new species of animals, animal and plant life, but not many. The influence of environment in modifying species is constantly in his mind. <clears throat> The naturalist can content himself with a day of little things if he can read only a word of one syllable in the book of nature. He will make the most of that. I read such a word the other morning when I perceived when watching a young but fully fledged junco or snowbird that its markings were like those of the vesper sparrow. The young of birds always for a brief period repeat the markings of the birds of the parent stem parent stem from which they are an offshoot. Thus the young of a robins have speckled breasts, betraying their, their thrush kinship, and the young, young junco shows in its striped appearance of breast and back, and the lateral white quills in the tail its kinship to the grass finch or vesper sparrow. The slate color soon obliterates most of these signs, but the white quills remain. It has departed from the nesting habits of its forebears. 
The vesper sparrow nests upon the ground in the open fields, but the junco chooses a mossy bank or tussock by the roadside, or in the woods, and constructs a very artistic nest of dry grass and hair, which is so well hidden that the passer-by seldom detects it. Another small word I read about certain of the rocks in my native Catskills, a laminated blue-gray sandstone, that when you split them open with steel wedges and a big hammer, or blown them, with, blown them with, up with dynamite, instead of the gray, fresh surface of the rock greeting you, it is often a surface of red mud, as if the surface had been enameled or electrotyped with mud. It appears to date from the first muddy day of creation. I have such a one for my doorstone door at Woodchuck Lodge. It is amusing to see the sweepers and scrubbers of doorstones fall upon it with soap and hot water and utterly fail to make any impression upon it. Nowhere else have I seen rocks case-hardened with primal mud. The freshwater origin of the Catskill rocks no doubt in some way accounts for it. We are all interested students of the weather, but the naturalist studies it for some insight into the laws which govern it. One season I made my reputation as a weather prophet by predicting on the first day of December a very severe winter. It was an easy guess. I saw in Detroit a bird from the far north, a bird I had never before seen, the Bohemian waxwing or chatterer. It breeds above the Arctic Circle and is common to both hemispheres. <clears throat> I said when the Arctic birds come down, be sure there is a cold wave behind them and so it proved. When the birds fail to give one a hint of the probable character of the coming winter, what reliable signs remain? These remain. When December is marked by sudden and violent extremes of heat and cold, the winter will be broken, the cold will not hold. I have said elsewhere that the hum of the bee in December is the requiem of a winter. But when the season is very evenly spaced, the cold, slowly and steadily increasing through November and December, no hurry, no violence, then be prepared for a snug winter. As to wet and dry summers, one can always be <clears throat> guided by rainfall on the Pacific coast. A shortage on the western coast means an excess on the eastern. For four or five years past, California has been short of its rainfall, so much so that quite a general quite that quite general alarm is felt over the gradual shrinkage of their stored up supplies, the dams and reservoirs. And during the summer seasons the parts of New England and New York with which I am acquainted have had very wet seasons, floods in midsummer and full springs and wells at other time at all times. The droughts have been temporary and local. We say, as fickle as the weather, but the meteorological laws are pretty well defined. All signs fail in a drought, and all signs fail in a wet season. At one time the south wing bring, wind brings no rain, at another time the north and northwest winds do bring wet rain. The complex of conditions over a continental area of rivers and lakes and mountain chains is too vast for us to decipher. It inheres in the nature of things. It is one of the potencies and possibilities which matter possesses. We can take no step beyond that.